Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Tim Huxley, Executive Director of the Asia Office of the International Institute for Strategic Studies here in Singapore. Uh, IISS Asia is one of the international offices of the IISS, which has its headquarters in London. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, latest event in the IISS Fullerton Lecture Series. This is the 23rd Fullerton Lecture uh, in the series which started three and a half years ago. As many of you will know already, the spirit and purpose of this lecture series is to inspire informed and intelligent public debate on matters of international importance from an international perspective. Uh, for those of you who are watching the webcast of this Fullerton Lecture remotely, I should say that we're holding this event in the ballroom of the imposing and historic Fullerton Hotel in the heart of Singapore's financial district. And I should also mention that on Monday this week, this building was uh, fittingly gazetted as Singapore's 71st national monument, a move that recognizes its importance in Singapore's history. In the past, it was not only Singapore's general post office, I remember coming here 30 years ago to buy stamps and send postcards, but it also accommodated a number of important government departments. We are honored this Wednesday evening to have with us as our 23rd IISS Fullerton lecturer, the Honorable Tony Abbott, MP for Warringah, a constituency in the north of Sydney, and of course, Australia's most recent former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott graduated with degrees in economics and law from Sydney University and in politics and philosophy from Queen's College, Oxford. In his early uh, career, he was a journalist with The Australian, a senior advisor to then opposition leader John Hewson and director of the organization Australians for Constitutional Monarchy. Mr. Abbott was first elected to the parliament in 1994 and as part of John Howard's government served as parliamentary secretary, minister, cabinet minister, and as leader of the House of Representatives. He was leader of Australia's Liberal Party from 2009 to 2015, and he was prime minister from 2013 to 2015. Like the tenures of many national political leaders, Mr. Abbott's time as prime minister was characterized by achievements and sometimes by controversies. In terms of international policy, having once said before he became Prime Minister that Australia's foreign policy should have a Jakarta rather than a Geneva focus, Tony Abbott's leadership was notable for a determined effort to intensify Australia's relations with key Asian countries, including free trade agreements with Japan, the Republic of Korea, and with China. In the Southeast Asian context, as Prime Minister, Mr. Abbott made particular efforts to strengthen bilateral relations with Singapore, reaching agreement earlier this year on a comprehensive strategic partnership, which Singapore's PM, Lee Sheng Loong, described as a roadmap for closer relations in trade, investment, foreign policy, defense, and security. Today, though, Mr. Abbott is going to talk about some of the more difficult aspects of international relations, focusing, I think, on key trouble spots, including the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the South China Sea. Following his address, uh, he has very kindly agreed to respond to questions, questions relating to the substance of his speech. Uh, and so, Mr. Abbott, the floor is now yours. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. Well, Tim, thank you so much. It is a real pleasure to be the 23rd Fullerton Lecturer. In the wake of the Paris atrocities and the elusiveness of a strategy to deal with the terrorist caliphate that inspired them, in the wake of ongoing challenges to a rules-based international order, in Eastern Europe and in our own region, and in the wake of sluggish global growth and the problems democratic governments have with overspending and overregulating, it's easy to be downcast about the world's prospects. Yet there is a powerful antidote to despondency and defeatism, 
And it's right here before us in the recent history of Singapore in particular and of our region in general. With its crowded island and lack of natural resources, Singapore might so easily have been poor. With its ideological conflicts and strategic rivalries, the Indo-Pacific region might so readily have been a battleground. And with their religious and ethnic tensions, many Indo-Pacific countries might so often be failing states. Yet in the past 40 years, our region has seen the fastest and largest ever advance in human well-being. In China, half a billion people are surging from poverty into the middle class. Hundreds of millions more are making the same transition in India and in Indonesia, the emerging democratic superpowers of Asia. South Korea, Hong Kong and Taiwan have moved from the third world to the first in a little over a generation. And here in Singapore, stability, respect for private property and a genius for business has produced a wonder of the modern world, a marvellous fusion, if you like, of Chinese culture, British justice and Western values. It's not all plain sailing. China's economic growth is slowing, while Japan's is not speeding up. China is flexing its muscles along the nine-dash line. The United States resolve is being tested in our region as elsewhere, and there are local tremors from the security challenges of the Middle East. Yes, there are problems, but our region's history suggests that none of them are intractable with the right leadership. Overwhelmingly, the people of our region are more free, more prosperous and more safe than would even have been imaginable just 40 years ago. There's been a readiness to adopt new technology and more cautiously new ideas. There's been a preparedness to develop new markets, especially export ones. There's been a willingness to trust people more with economic freedom, if not always political rights. There's been a region-wide zeal for education. And crucially, crucially, there's been comparative peace under the benign leadership of the United States. Now, I'm proud that Australia has played a big part in our region's progress. The post-war Colombo plan educated many of the region's future leaders in Australia. In 1957, just 13 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Australia's trade treaty with Japan was a watershed in the reconciliation of wartime enemies. Subsequently, Australian iron ore, coal and gas powered the economies, the miracles of Japan, Korea and then China, the greatest and the most remarkable transformation of all. More recently, as Tim has mentioned, my government concluded free trade agreements with Korea, with Japan and with China as part of our readiness to provide energy security, resource security and food security to our region. Just last year we had the militaries of China, Japan and Korea working together in the search for the missing aircraft MH370. We've been part of confidence building trilateral military exercises with the Chinese and the Americans. We've strongly encouraged and supported the United States pivot to Asia, involving not, not just modest forces rotating through Darwin, but also the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the world's biggest free trade deal, because security and prosperity over time are inevitably linked. The pivot, indeed, was President Obama's acknowledgement, his acknowledgement of the difference that American leadership can make. As the world has increasingly discovered, Australia is strong enough to be a valuable partner and is naturally inclined to be a helpful one. We're the world's 12th largest economy. We're the world's largest exporter of iron ore. We'll soon be the world's largest exporters of coal and gas. 
We're one of the world's biggest exporters of beef. We're fifth in the number of universities in the world's top 100 and host the fourth highest number of international students. We're one of the few Western countries whose military capability is greater now than a decade ago. Around the world, Australians have a reputation for plain speaking, for problem solving and for respecting reasonable points of view. My government stood up for the universal decencies of mankind, calling out Russia for its role in the shooting down of MH17 and making the second largest contribution to the international coalition against the terrorist caliphate in Iraq and Syria. Like America, Australia takes no position on the territorial disputes in the South China and East China Seas, but we hold that they should be resolved peacefully and in accordance with international law. With America, we deplore unilateral alteration of the status quo and assert the absolute right to freedom of navigation on the sea and in the air. But unlike America, we were happy to join the Chinese-led Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, especially once its governance arrangements, at our urging, were improved to reflect those of other international institutions. As Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Sien Lung notes, there's a lack of strategic trust between the United States and China. Now, this is a pity because China's success is not due to communist ideology, but to enlightened self-interest, in particular to a most uncommunist measure of respect for entrepreneurship. China's economic strength should be welcomed for the good it's done around the world, and China should be encouraged to carry more of the responsibilities that come with success. China has traded its way to prosperity under a relatively peaceful world order guaranteed by American strength and benevolence. And on this basis, America could as easily feel proud of China's success as threatened by it. Eventually, China may become the dominant power in our region. Yet for many decades, thanks to its scientific innovation, corporate creativity and cultural appeal, quite apart from its military prowess, America will remain the key stabiliser in the Indo-Pacific and by far the world's most influential and important nation. China should have more than enough domestic challenges to risk adventurism abroad, bringing the rest of its people into a modern economy, liberalising its society and eventually its polity while maintaining order, managing its disparate regions and cleaning up some of the world's worst pollution. As well, the regional security architecture, such as the East Asia Summit, should help to keep America and China talking rather than shouting at each other. Although history shows that great powers don't usually rise without conflict, the major countries now have such mutual interdependence as well as the power of mutual destruction that the better lesson is that all of us will advance together or none of us will advance at all. Despite the risk of miscalculation, crippling tensions in our region are unlikely because even a Cold War would be bad for everyone. By contrast, Islamic State, or the death cult, as it's now increasingly called, thrives on conflict. Conflict is what it exists for. The bloodier, the better. And conflict will continue until it's destroyed. That's why it's currently the biggest threat to the world's peace and stability. In the past few weeks alone, the death cult has blown up a Russian jetliner, killing 224 people, killed 130 people in multiple attacks in Paris, killed scores in suicide bombings in the Middle East, inspired the massacre of 14 people in California and sparked a four-day lockdown of Brussels. This 
would-be terrorist empire proclaiming death to the infidel continues to control a territory about the size of Italy in Syria and Iraq and holds sway over about 8 million people. But we have to understand this as well as to condemn it. As the Declaration of the Caliphate shows, Islamic State wants to emulate Muhammad, whose early campaigns would have looked just as puny to the great powers of his day. But repeatedly, since the attack on the World Trade Center, sophisticated modern societies have shown their vulnerability to quite small numbers of terrorists heedless of their own lives and merciless to others. Islamic State has a simple but deadly message, submit or die. To most, a medieval fantasy, but rational enough to many Muslims based on their scriptures. Islamic State aims to overthrow every government, and while all governments say they want to destroy it, nearly all have other priorities. The Saudis and the Gulf states are more fearful of Iran, of Iran than of Islamic State. The Turks are more concerned about the Kurds. The Iranians and the Russians are more interested in propping up the Assad regime. The Americans want to destroy Islamic State, but not if it means indirectly helping Assad or US combat casualties. The French want to wage pitiless war, but not to commit ground troops. So while every government has hard to meet preconditions for more effective action, Islamic State holds its key centres, inspires copycat movements in the ungoverned spaces of Libya, Nigeria, Yemen and Afghanistan, and urges its supporters everywhere to kill any infidel they can. The Sunnis of the Caliphate so far are as frightened of the Shiite militia as they are of the death cults, crucifixions, beheadings, mass executions and sexual slavery. So the Middle East remains a witch's brew of complexity and danger where nothing ends well, but it's still everyone's business. Yes, intervening in Iraq and then Libya ended badly, but not intervening in Syria has so far had the most disastrous results of all. A quarter of a million dead, seven million internally displaced, and four million in camps beyond the borders thinking of coming to Europe, while Islamic State posts online for the world to see ever more barbaric ways to kill people. Of course, adding Russians versus Americans, or Christians versus Muslims, to Shiite versus Sunni, and Sunni versus Sunni would be a new nightmare. What's needed is the right intervention because left to fester, this metastasizing threat to the world's peace and prosperity can only get worse. Plainly, the destruction of Islamic State will need to involve Sunni forces. Plainly, any longer term settlement in Syria and Iraq will need to accommodate all the significant minorities. The winner-take-all mindset that has plagued the Middle East can't continue, but it won't change without some leadership from the outside. When President Obama said last year that America could no longer be the world's policeman on its own, I said that Australia may not be America's most powerful or most important ally but would strive to be its most dependable one. Because America is the only country with the strength and high-mindedness for this task. The challenge, as the President has said, is finding a strategy for Syria. Because without a strategy for Syria, as well as for Iraq, there can be no victory. As Prime Minister, I encouraged a US-led summit specifically to deal with Islamic State that would have had to involve Russia, Iran and the key Sunni countries as well as the main Western powers. In the wake of Paris, coordinated action is 
more urgent than ever, and France also now has the moral authority to contribute the leadership that's needed. A military victory over the Caliphate isn't a sufficient response to the challenge of militant Islam, but it is a necessary one. The alternative is more attacks on decent people going about their daily lives until the resolve is there to escalate the military campaign against it. That's the challenge. Creating Iraqi and Syrian forces that can destroy the caliphate while respecting non-combatants and in the longer term fostering governments in the Middle East that don't commit genocide against their own peoples or permit terrorism against ours. It may involve the commitment of Western troops to fight alongside local forces. It may involve the creation of safe havens protected by no-fly zones. It may ultimately involve a subdivided Syria, as William Hager suggested. But what it can't involve is the persistence of a blood-soaked caliphate killing in the name of God. This will be a long, difficult and costly engagement, quite possibly the task of decades, not years. But before we shrink from such a prospect, we should remember how much the world has gained from the United States and its allies sustained post-war willingness to stand up for universal values as well as for their own interests. The latest announcement of 300 uh, 200 uh, special operations troops to fight in Iraq and Syria is a sign that America is finally edging towards the action needed to win this war. So is the British Parliament's support for an air bombardment against Islamic State in Syria. Here in the Indo-Pacific we have seen what can be achieved in peace with humane values and the right leadership. America has not ceased being the indispensable nation just because the world is in transition. Here in Singapore, everywhere, everywhere around us, we see the results of outstanding local leadership that US global leadership has made possible. Wishful thinking and the search for the safe option didn't produce a large measure of security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, and it won't in the Middle East either. Because wherever people have the chance, they gravitate to greater freedom and more choice. People should be free to vote as they wish, to worship as they wish, to work as they wish, and to associate as they wish, provided they respect the right of others to make different choices. Treat others as you would have them treat you is less a Western concept than a universal aspiration wherever people are free to work out their futures for themselves. It is indeed the only rational choice to make. At the heart of a rules-based international order is this fragrant idea that we must be ready now and always, to assert and defend. So thank you, Tim, for the opportunity uh, to give this address. Uh, it's always a pleasure and an honour uh, to address a gathering of this quality, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr Abbott, thank you very much for, um, for your... Uh, excellent Fullerton lecture, which was uh, which was uh, wide-ranging. Um, you started off by uh, by talking about the Asia Pacific region, and I was very impressed by how uh, upbeat uh, uh, you you are about this region, which we live in uh, the middle of. Sometimes maybe we're too preoccupied, particularly over the last year or two, with the, the problems that we see from, uh, from being in the middle of the region. But it, uh, it was great to hear your, your very positive uh, assessment of the way this region is, is, is going and that all the, and, 
to, to listen to your emphasis on all the um, uh, positive developments uh, here uh, in what you call the Indo-Pacific region. Um, but um, I, I suppose fundamentally you, what you're saying is that all the, the, the actors in this region are by and large rational mm -hmm. and, and that helps to explain why this region is going so well. And then by way of contrast, you, you highlighted the problems mm -hmm. in the Middle East and you focus very strongly on this uh, really major uh, security challenge, not just to the, its immediate region but to the, the wider world posed by the, um, by the Islamic State and its... Uh, its barbarity, and you, you argued uh, for what you called the right sort of mm -hmm. intervention, and you um, emphasized the, the need for, for leadership, and particularly for the United States, supported by its good mm -hmm. allies and, and partners to, to provide that leadership, and you provided some uh, specifics on uh, what sort of intervention might stand a, a chance of uh, working, so I think we've, we've been highly fortunate to, to uh, hear your perspective on uh, on the, these challenges um, and the prospects for their resolution. Uh, so uh, now we have an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, I'm sure there'll be many in our, our audience here uh, who'd like to ask uh, Mr. Abbott questions. Could I please reiterate uh, that any questions from Mr. Abbott should please relate to the subject matter uh, of his Fullerton uh, lecture that he has just uh, delivered. And thank you very much for uh, your understanding on that point in advance of the, of the questions. So could anyone who'd like to ask a question please raise uh, his or her hand. The microphone will come to you once I've uh, acknowledged your, your question. And then when the microphone comes to you, could you please say who you are um, what your uh, affiliation is, and then pose your question to Mr. Abbott as uh, succinctly and as uh, directly as you can. Who will be first? Sir, in the... Uh, I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about 90, and I'm a Singaporean. My name is Amir Jumaboy. Uh, we're four generations here in Singapore, but I'm of Indian origin. I'm also a Muslim. Your explanations on what is happening in the Middle East is something that concerns uh, uh, me in the first instance. I would refer you to the Amman Accord. The Amman Accord, led by the King of Jordan, was written in 2006, where all the sects of Islam were listed. Sunnis, not Sunnis, Sunnis and Shias and others. There are 10 of them. Every country and every area where there were Muslims, including Singapore, signed that. The first declaration there is that terrorism is against Islamic preachings. All these nations have signed that and half of them have broken their signatures of their kings, including Saudi Arabia, Iran, all the other countries. So that is one thing we should not forget, that that was the previous thing. The solution to this lies amongst the Muslims themselves. They should organize large conferences, particularly in America, Britain, uh, the EU, EU, and Britain, of scholars, Muslim scholars, and others, to say that this is not Islam. Islam does not teach these things and it is against Islam. What's happening here is what's something that happened in the past in the time of Christendom between the Catholics and the Protestants when it started uh, to begin each calling the other infidels. Mr. Jumaboy, sorry, do you have a question for so, Mr. Abbott? I was just I, I, trying I to correct that. I think he's making some very interesting observations. I, I was saying 
that it is up to the world Muslim community to gather in all these countries to condemn ISIS and what they're doing as being against Islam. That is a comment I wanted to make. I thought I would add to what people know about these mm -hmm. things. Thank you very much. You. And the other thing is the world. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I agree with you, sir, about China's rise. I hope it's peaceful and the rise of Asia is on the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, think, I think they are very uh, wise observations that you've made. Uh, I, I think that uh, it is very important that uh, Muslims um, look into their hearts and ask themselves some profound questions about their faith and uh, resolve uh, as powerfully and as effectively as they can that there has to be a spirit of live and let live uh, in all religions, including Islam. Uh, now, I think we've seen in the Middle East in particular uh, um, some strands of Islam which don't have live and let live in their hearts and it's very important that this be addressed. And you're absolutely right, sir. Uh, only Muslims can do this. Uh, now, I, I've been lucky enough uh, over the past couple of years to have a number of conversations with the King of Jordan. And I'm not at all surprised that he was uh, there in Amman helping to sponsor such a sensible declaration. But it's one thing to resolve in Amman um, no doubt uh, with the influence of King Abdullah there uh, so sensibly, it's another thing to actually, uh, I suppose, promulgate that same spirit of live and let live in the wider Islamic world, and that's what we so abundantly need right now. But as well as that, I think we also need to deal with the problem of the caliphate. Uh, and there is, uh, if you like, a, um, uh, there are changes inside Islam uh, which would be very helpful for the world. Um, there, I guess, is um, changes inside all countries that would help to address these issues, but there is the immediate difficulty of this terrorist caliphate, and that has to be faced up to very squarely as well. Thank you very much. Madam... Thanks. Um, my name is Pranoti Survey. I'm with Bank of America Merrill Lynch here in Singapore. I head their political and security uh, risk intelligence unit. Now, my question uh, is with reference to um, bringing things back to Asia Pacific. I know you mentioned uh, uh, in your lecture that we're seeing some tremors here, but from your perspective, uh, what are some of the areas where we are going to see um, you know, sort of an increase in the in the number and uh, the strength of these irrational character, irrational actors in Asia Pacific, uh, specifically. And what are some of the areas um, that uh, you know kind of need to be addressed with urgency, with increasing urgency um, in the short term, specifically um, to um, you know stem the proliferation of uh, radicalization that's mm -hmm. pr spreading out from the Islamic State in the Middle East. Thank you. Um, well, I think it's, it's very important that we acknowledge that all of us have got a problem. Uh, Australia uh, likes to say that we are the world's most successful multicultural society. Uh, we certainly have been, I think, a remarkably blessed place. Uh, and we are uh, a place where everyone should feel welcome. Uh, and yet even Australia uh, has provided uh, up to 200 people uh, for Islamic State. Um, we've got roughly the same number of people working uh, to finance and recruit for Islamic State uh, in Australia. Um, we've got uh, well over 400 active counter-terrorist investigations uh, on foot at this time. So um, this uh, problem is a problem that is reaching out uh, to all countries and we, we've even found in Australia um, 
people who uh, you would never have expected uh, have fallen under the influence, the spell of, uh, of, of the Islamic State death cult. I mean, um, the captain of Toowoomba, one of, of a high school in Toowoomba, um, doctors who appear to have the world at their feet uh, have succumbed to the lure of Islamic State. So it's, it's a problem uh, for everyone. Luckily, uh, in this region, uh, we don't have any failing states. Uh, we don't have any countries whose governments uh, uh, are incapable of effective security measures. And increasingly, uh, around our region, there is the closest possible security cooperation and intelligence cooperation uh, between all governments. But as we've seen in Australia and elsewhere, uh, there are people who are not on our radar uh, who have radicalised online and are more than capable of picking up any weapon at all uh, and creating as much mayhem as they can. So uh, it is a problem for everyone uh, and in the end uh, absolutely necessary, though a strong security response is. Um, we, we need to address the allure uh, of Islamic State and part of that uh, is defeating it because as long as it survives, um, there is this uh, idea that somehow it is of God. Uh, and if it fails, almost by definition, it is not. Right at the back there, gentleman in the lilac shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Jin. I'm a Singaporean citizen like Mr. Jamaboya, fourth generation here. Thank you very much for sharing with, uh, with us your uh, thoughts of ISIS and this uh, new terminology, the death cult. Can you perhaps share with us your thoughts in terms of a roadmap to resolving this situation with ISIS or the death cult? And then the other question I have is, you know, what, you, you've described the geopolitical factions and the tensions. What are the three possible commonalities that will draw all of them together to resolve this? Okay, well, uh, there needs to be an effective military response uh, in the Middle East, and it can't be simply a uh, Western-led response. Uh, uh, it has to be largely local forces uh, that deal with this, but um, I don't believe local forces are capable of dealing with it on their own. Uh, and that's where uh, some outside help is necessary. Uh, more help than is currently being given. Uh, and as you may know, Australia, as part of the US-led coalition, is currently providing training to the Iraqi army as well as airstrikes on terrorist targets in Syria and Iraq. But, but more does need to be done, I believe, uh, if local forces are to be effective in dealing with the caliphate on the ground. Um, we need a strong security response at home as well as abroad. Um, we need, uh, uh, as Mr Jumboy was saying, um, uh, Muslims uh, to be um, working uh, effectively to ensure that um, Islam is uh, more generally a religion of peace than it currently seems. Um, that's very important. I think we also need uh, to recover our own cultural self-confidence. Um, we need to provide people uh, with more inspiration in their lives. Uh, uh, alienated young people will cast around for things to believe in uh, and if there aren't good things for them to believe in uh, they will have a tendency to, to seize on evil things to believe in and this is what we've seen with Islamic State. So I think there needs to be, if you like, a hearts and minds strategy as well as a security one but I think um, we are inching towards it as President Obama's uh, recent announcements show. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Surya. Yeah, I'm 
Surya from the Institute of South Asian Studies here at the National University of Singapore. Sir, uh, you have referred essentially to irrational non-state actors. As a former prime minister, do you think there are also any irrational state actors either on your radar or flying below the radar? And if so, how would you address them? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, there were certainly times when, uh, uh, at the time of the MH17 atrocity, uh, when uh, I asked that very question myself uh, about uh, a large and powerful country uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, <laughs> I, I think state actors, almost by definition, uh, are much more rational than non-state actors because um, they've got vast territories that they need to maintain and they uh, invariably are expected by their citizens or subjects to provide a whole range of services which, um, generally speaking, uh, require levels of management, levels of organisation uh, to, uh, uh, to continue. I mean, the difficulty is uh, this, uh, this out-of-control, would-be terrorist theocracy uh, in, in Syria and Iraq, and I just believe that there is a radical difference between that and any state actor that we um, have at the moment. Now, you know, uh, can we can we say that uh, it's inconceivable that a state could be formed um, that uh, that is motivated by uh, things that we would regard as utterly irrational? Well, that's exactly what this caliphate aims to be. It aims to be, uh, uh, if you like, a, a universal state. That's what it aims to be, a universal state based on a particular interpretation uh, of Sharia um, with this submit or die uh, modus operandi. And that's why I think this is such a radically different and radically greater threat than the sorts of state-on-state um, -state tensions that we are more familiar with here in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific region more generally. Mr Abbott, maybe I could uh, ask a mm -hmm. question if I could uh, presume to do that. Um, uh, this, this question brings together, the, I suppose, the two halves of, mm -hmm. of, of your lecture, um, Asia and the Middle East. Do you think Asian countries could do more to combat the Islamic State? Because it, it's noticeable that the only the, the countries that are, and the forces that are doing the, the fighting uh, and the campaigning are, are Middle Eastern countries to some extent and and Western countries. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but I am pretty sure that Singapore has provided Singapore. a refueler to the Singapore Arab has, nations. and also some planners and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. image analysis. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not true yeah. that Asian countries are doing nothing. It's not true they're doing nothing, yeah. but they're not, yeah. overall, they're not doing yeah. much. And, and good on Singapore for providing such a good example here. But, um, well, it's a very fair point you raise because a generation ago, people like myself would have said that Islam in Southeast Asia is quite different from Islam in the Middle East um, and perhaps in the subcontinent. Uh, and yet the impression I have is that over the last 30 years or so, uh, Southeast Asian Islam has become more Middle Eastern, if you like, mm. uh, and has become more hardline than it was. Now, I think that's a pity. I think that's a real pity. And if we are going to have the changes in Islam that uh, we've been talking about earlier today, they may need to develop in countries with a tradition of civil liberties. Uh, because let's face it, if uh, I'm a moderate Muslim in large swathes of the Middle East uh, and I attempt to 
proselytize, I'm likely to be killed uh, or silenced one way or another. So if there is to be these changes within Islam, uh, Southeast Asia could be critical uh, to bringing them about. Mm. But, but in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the potential for other Asian countries yeah. to, to commit, to make a, a more substantial military commitment, do you, do you see that? Well, plainly, it's, it's, up, it's up to them. But this fight has got to be won substantially by Sunni forces okay. on the ground. Now, um, if, if uh, Muslim countries from beyond the region wish to be involved, uh, I, I think that certainly would be encouraging. Uh, precisely how they should be involved is the kind of detailed thinking which needs to be carried on um, uh, arising out of the kind of summit that I was trying to encourage when I was Prime Minister. Mm. Thank you. Sir, in the front on the left. Uh, Mr. Alex Blythe, I run a small business here. Um, I'm just wondering what the chances are, or whether you just speculate on the chances of more irrational actors uh, such as Donald Trump appearing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, it's, it's not normally my practice to, uh, uh, to offer a running commentary on um, uh, the politics of, uh, of, of elections in other countries. Um, look, uh, when you don't have strong mainstream representation, uh, when you don't have credible mainstream leadership, uh, you get... Uh, less credible leadership offering itself and looking at America from afar there appears to be uh, a degree of popular alienation from Washington in general and uh, the leadership of both major parties uh, in, in particular. Now I would very much be inclined to think that at some stage in the uh, Republican nominating process, um, the front runner will come back to the pack. That would be my, my instinct, because certainly uh, uh, the sorts of things that he said uh, would, uh, would suggest that uh, he would be a, uh, an interesting person to be the leader of the free world. Madam. Uh, Yelena Zimtsova, I'm uh, a Russian and a French citizen uh, living in Singapore, Singapore PR. Uh, you have mentioned uh, Russia in your speech, so what is your view on uh, international relations with Russia and how to go forward from here? Uh, well, the interesting thing about, about about Russia at the moment is that is that uh, Russia under its current leadership is is probably the only it's the only major country uh, in Europe that has embarked on uh, wars of aggression against smaller weaker neighbours and and I think that's a terrible problem it's a really terrible problem and um, in the end uh, this will be bad for Russia because Russia is ramping up its military at a time when its economy is in all sorts of trouble so uh, while I can certainly understand uh, the um, mother Russia instincts that the current leadership has and the support that this kind of nationalism might generate amongst Russian people in the short term. Uh, in the long term, I think that the expense of all of this uh, will be very difficult to sustain economically and uh, my instinct is that it will be bad for Russia 
uh, as well as being terrible for the, for the countries which are subjected to uh, the attentions of, uh, of Russia and its proxies right now. I mean, um, <clears throat> President Poroshenko of, of Ukraine uh, is in the incredibly difficult position of trying to transform his country's economy while at the same time being subject to a, um, a Russian-backed and inspired insurrection in the East. Now, this is a very, very difficult position to be in, and I would have thought that in the longer run, um, Russia would be much stronger uh, as part of the international community than as always on the edge of pariah status, which is where it's been for the last few years. Thank you very much for that answer. It uh, reminds me that exactly a year ago to the day, uh, President Poroshenko was speaking on this, yeah. on this uh, very platform, and we heard from him at, at, uh, at, at first hand about the, the challenges that mm. he faces that uh, certainly haven't improved over the last mm. year. So, thank you. Um, the, just here in the... Uh, in the middle, about four rows back. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Abedin from Channel News Asia. Um, my question is that traditionally, Australia has been seen as um, the deputy sheriff or, or, or um, America's sheriff in Asia. And you have mentioned that um, uh, in recent times we've seen the U.S. having some challenges in playing its role as a traditional um, policeman or the policeman um, uh, the international policemen. What do you see um, as Australia's role now? Uh, is Australia still supposed to be the deputy sheriff, or do, do you see other countries like China having to step up? No one has ever used that phrase. No Australian leader has ever used that <laughs> phrase, uh, a deputy sheriff. Um, it was my, my distinguished uh, friend and former Prime Minister John Howard was verbaled a little. I think a journalist put that to him and uh, he didn't adopt it, but nevertheless it found its way into the newspaper article and it's then found its way into, I suppose, a, a general speech. But we've certainly never described ourselves in those terms. Um, but I certainly think that Australia should be a very strong and dependable ally of the United States. Uh, we have been a strong and dependable ally of the United States most recently in the Middle East. Um, but our very strong alliance with the United States is not, in my judgment, directed against anyone. Rather, it's an alliance for stability and security. Uh, and I think there's uh, no inconsistency whatsoever between being the closest possible strategic partner of the United States uh, and a very good friend of China. Uh, and certainly in my own prime ministership, uh, uh, I was eager to be a very good friend to China and um, we elevated our relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership and I guess the fruit of that was the free trade agreement between China and Australia, which is the first free trade agreement that China has signed with a major Western economy. So, look, uh, uh, I think the United States is overwhelmingly a force for good in the world. Um, yes, the United States makes mistakes. Uh, all countries makes, m make mistakes. But as a very senior Singaporean leader said to me today, um, America blunders from time to time, but America always has a big heart. Um, they are high-minded and idealistic in a way in which few other countries are. And this is why I think it is important uh, that we encourage the Americans to stay very involved in this region. Uh, no other country has the strength and the high-mindedness to be a plausible guarantor of a stable, rules-based international order. Uh, and that's why I say America remains the indispensable nation. Mm. Okay. Oh, we have time for one, one or two more questions, mm -hmm. if that's all right, Mr. Abbott. Uh, sir.
Thank you, Mr. Abbott, for a very insightful talk this evening. I am Professor Houston Kwa, President of the Economic Society of Singapore. Um, I would like to bring you back to the title that you have chosen for tonight's mm -hmm. talk on rationality and irrationality. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how you define rationality and irrationality, and who are the rational and the irrational actors specifically. Now, part of the reason why I'm asking this is that you study economics, and we mm -hmm. talk a lot about the rational man. And seemingly, a lot of the irrational actions and behaviors can at many times be found to be rational. So I think that part of the solution to this troubled world, and maybe the sum of the solutions, is to perhaps go back to the roots. Are these actions, in fact, irrational? And to search for the rational grounds and issues as to how these decisions are made. And from there, once we determine the whys, we can think of a more long-lasting, effective solution rather than dividing the world into rational and irrational actors. I would like to hear a comment. Okay, well, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and um, all uh, organising principles have their limitations, uh, and this organising principle has its limitations, uh, as all others likewise do. Uh, there's no doubt that if you accept the version of Islam that the leaders of, Is of Islamic State proclaim, their actions are rational enough. But I don't believe that uh, most people would accept those fundamental premises. Um, I mean, one of the points I make is that uh, um, not all cultures are equal, uh, and I am more than ready to, a, to assert the superiority of a culture that is decent and humane, uh, open and welcoming, over a culture that thinks it's right to kill in the name of God. Uh, I just think it is irrational to kill in the name of God because once you embrace that principle, um, we have the war of, of, of all against all uh, until there's only one man or uh, one particular uh, faith or version of faith standing. Now, that's a recipe for catastrophe, absolute catastrophe. So, so um, wh while I I take your point about different starting points uh, and being rational uh, from different starting points. Some starting points I don't accept are really rational places to be. Hmm. One more, just one more question. At, at the back, lady in the red dress. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Abbott. Um, you are advocating for the Sorry, West. Could, could you say who you are? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, my name is Diane. I'm a law student at the National University of Singapore. Thank you. Um, you are advocating for the West's leadership both militarily and ideologically, and you are also making a good argument against cultural relativism. Mm -hmm. But do you perhaps think that the West could be complicit, perhaps, in the rise of ISIS, especially mm -hmm. in its relationship, in its close relationship and close ally with Saudi Arabia? Okay. That's a, an interesting question, and I, I guess there's, there's little doubt that at different times uh, important people in Saudi have supported um, Islamist groups, uh, even Islamist terrorist groups. Uh, I, I, I certainly accept that, but I think the Saudis have, have learnt from that experience and certainly uh, all of the recent statements coming from the Saudi leadership are very robust and, and, and very strong. Um, yes, the Saudis are still um, very concerned about the Iranians, uh, um, but nevertheless I think they now have a better appreciation of the fact that uh, Islamic State is coming for them just as much as it's coming for everyone else. I mean, this is the thing. Islamic State uh, has in its sights um, every government, um, 
everyone who doesn't subscribe to its particular version of, of Islam. And while I think there was a time when different people in the Middle East thought that their immediate interests might be served by supporting uh, some of these groups, uh, I think they've all been disabused of that notion uh, in more recent times. Now, we all know that uh, um, if you're uh, uh, a very significant international actor, um, you will have many relationships and some of the people with whom you have relationships will be less savoury than others. Uh, that's just part of living in an imperfect and complex world. Uh, but but um, I, I think that it is dawning on everyone. Certainly it ought to dawn on everyone and some kind of international summit specifically to deal with Islamic State will help to reinforce uh, this dawning view that they help no one. Uh, they are everyone's enemy and uh, I think, I think the Saudis are well and truly appraised of that now. Thank you very much for that very uh, clear answer to that, that uh, last question. And uh, I, I, I'm afraid we have to bring this uh, 23rd Fullerton Lecture to a close now, but I'd, I'd like to thank you for answering all those uh, good questions from our audience. They were very so, good questions. So uh, authoritatively. Um, uh, your Fullerton Lecture today and... Uh, and your frank answers and uh, very full answers to those questions, I think, have been uh, very, uh, very helpful to us in, in, in framing how we think uh, about international security problems, and particularly this major challenge from the Islamic State, uh, which has emerged over the last uh, two years as a, as a, as a I, th I think it's true to say a massive international security mm -hmm. problem that's felt around the world and not just in the in the Middle East. Um, so we're extremely grateful to you for, for making time to visit Singapore and to uh, deliver this Fullerton lecture. Thank you very much again, sir. Um, so unfortunately, we have to, we have to close now. Um, could uh, uh, members of the uh, audience please stay in the uh, seats and, until we've left, left the room? But uh, first of all, maybe we could uh, congratulate Mr. Abba. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great, thank you.